I'm trying to record. Okay, I just started recording. So we're a little late with it, but that's all right. <laughs> I can just up, restart. So we'll <laughs> Thank you, Hama. My name is Emma Regera, and I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Development. And uh, I wanted to really just start with something a little bit, um, uh, maybe maybe you're not thinking yet about this, but the reason why we are supporting your research is one of the many reasons that we support your career here is really to think about your, your promotion. If you are on the long road that becomes very short, really, to tenure, uh, you have to think about, for example, just yes, six years blocks, and you are going to uh, go out for review for reappointment more or less in year three, and then you will be reviewed for tenure and, and you know, associate professor promotion on year six, more or less. And uh, what you need to, to have, this is what we are going to be looking for, is uh, to prove that you have a record of sustained outstanding achievements in research, teaching, and service. Uh, but research is usually so important because it sustains so many of your professional activities. So these are the things that you usually need to get by the time you go after promotion uh, to associate professor with tenure, and it's competitive external research funding. Um, this is also critical for you to sustain your research program and your scholarship in the future, your publications, and also to be known and recognized because there is going to be a request of external letters to, to really vouch that you have the capacity to become a leader or have already become a leader. So this is really one of the efforts from the college to help you and support you as you go through this road. So this, are, this is, was my wish list, all the things I, I wish I had known when I started. The first is really how to find funding opportunities. To me, this was very foreign, very strange, very convoluted. Nobody had ever told me uh, I knew about a few funding agencies, but you have a lot of resources on campus that I hope that you feel comfortable exploring. The, the one that I like because it centralizes everything is the one from the uh, Vice President for Research, the Office of Research and Innovation, because you have all these links to directly go and find funding opportunities. And uh, for example, I just went into the find funding and I decided to go to grants.gov, that is a federal kind of a, a center or hub for all type of federal grants and uh, applications. And here, what I did is just enter a keyword. I'm a microbiologist, so I just enter microbiology and I came up with all the grants and funding opportunities that are available. And, and I noticed there was one about environmental engineering. I'm not an engineer, but I am an environmental microbiologist. So I said, okay, what the heck? Let's just go and check this. So I just click in the opportunity number and I was able to see the funding opportunity. One thing that I like is that they accept proposals at any time. This is really good. It gives me time for planning. Uh, but then you can start to look at other things. Uh, the number that you see here is very important. You're going to need it to tell Judy and her team to start with, so they know where to submit your proposal. But there is a lot of information, eligibility criteria. For example, uh, this type of grants from NSF, sometimes they're restricted to engineers. They have to be affiliated with the College of Engineering, and I, then I'm not eligible. Uh, submission dates, does it include a letter of intent this is required or is it optional? There will be a particular day to submit it, pre-proposal. Some proposals, you have to go through this scrutiny and review process before being invited to a full proposal. The budget, maybe all the things you want to propose, you know, for that budget is not worthy and then, or maybe it's too big. And then you need collaborators and you need to start to strategize and plan. The duration of the grant as well. And then very specific requirements to the program that you may want to consider. Maybe you have ideas and then you say, oh, they exclude this idea in particular because probably they already funded research in those areas or it's not this year. So these are the important things that you get in a glance when you start uh, looking at this. And I cannot, if I could, I would tell you again, read the solicitation. I work with so many people that don't read the solicitations and we make so many mistakes and we have to go back. And then thanks to having Judy and her team, they remind you, okay, I don't think this is right or you need this and that, but you should read it because you saved yourself a lot of time 
and angst in there. So they immediately, when you find something that you want to apply for, contact NATSAI Research Support Group as soon as possible. And then you go to their website and you immediately have the link to submit the proposal request form. And then really they are the liaison between you and OSP. And so what is OSP is this is the Office of Sponsor Programs. They, they are the people in central administration that actually submit the grant on behalf, on your behalf from the institution. So, so you need to have that type of connection. And, and in such a large university, it's very difficult for you to have contacts and, and I can't tell you how important it is to have Judy and the rest of the of the team there. So once you do that, yes, and this is my last slide to remember is um, it, it looks like a very convoluted process, but it's actually more simple. Um, we There are actually two parts of a sponsor programs administration that are relevant to your research grant. The one that I mentioned that is the one that helps you submit the grant. And then the one that administers the grants once hopefully you get the funding. So this is this is the cheat card, OSP pre-award, CGA post-award. And for anything is always NATSAI research support that can ease the pain and help you throughout the process. They not only they're instrumental for pre-award, but they can also help with post-award anything that you need and, and help you connect to the right uh, office in the in the university. So uh, this is all, this is the last slide. I'm going to, to pass the torch to Judy and Dani. I didn't have your picture, so I didn't do it, but uh, these are names that you should definitely have on a speed dial and the email should be the one that uh, you always memorize to help you along the way. And I'm sure there is going to be questions, but they are going to probably be answered by your presentation. So I won't take any more time and I'll pass it in to you, Judy. And I'm actually, Eric is here. So I'm gonna have Eric talk <laughs> before we start. Hello. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Judy. So um, just very briefly, uh, for those of you who haven't already met me, uh, my name is Eric Hag. I'm an Associate Dean for Budget planning, research, and administration. And of course, research is the reason that I'm here today. And I just want to highlight a couple of things that I'm sure you've already heard before, but I'm going to say it again. And that is, first and foremost, you have access to by far the best pre awards team and the entire university. No doubt, hands down, everyone will agree. And so, um, so that is awesome. You, you should feel very fortunate because they are that, that wonderful. Um, and, uh, and they're here you know, to help you. But to do that, you have to help them help you. And so how do you do that? Well, first and foremost, um, you know, tell them, as, as was pointed out by Hema just a moment ago, tell them when you're you know, getting ready or thinking about submitting a proposal. There's, you'll hear later about kind of an absolute deadline when you need to tell them by, but you don't have to wait till the deadline to tell them. You are allowed to tell them before the absolute deadline. Please, as soon as you think you know you're going to submit a grant or even thinking about maybe submitting a grant, contact them because this is really critical for them to, to be able to plan. Secondly, once you're in the process, communicate early and often. Uh, you simply cannot communicate too much because that's how they're going to stay up to date on where you are. You're going to understand and better appreciate what they need from you. And this is how this is how teams work, right? Teams work by communicating. And so to be an effective team, you have to communicate. So please, please, please communicate early and often. And then finally, um, you know, please hit the deadlines. Uh, there are deadlines. Uh, you're, again, you're allowed, to, you're allowed to beat the deadlines. You don't have to wait till the absolute last minute, but at a minimum, really please hit the, hit the deadlines. You have to remember, and, and, and you, know, I'm, you know, I write grants too. I totally understand when you're in the middle of writing a grant, it is the most important thing, perhaps the only important thing you are working on at that particular moment. But what you have to remember is this pre-awards team, which is so awesome, is working each, each and every one of them may be working on 20 or 30 other grants at the same time. 
each of one, each of which is the most important and only important thing for each of those other faculty members, okay? And so you can understand the stress that that can put on everybody. And so this is why hitting the deadlines and communicating early and often is so is so important, um, because then you'll really be uh, you'll be a team. You work together, and they'll be able to help you, and you'll help them to help you. So that's all I have to say. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Eric. Okay, I'm going to share my screen, and we are going to jump in. It's going to be a lot of information. We've recorded it, and we will send you all the slide deck, which will have a lot of links to a lot of things that will help you. So it'll it'll go by quickly, and it'll be a large a large amount of information. But bear with us. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna now. I need to come here to my presentation. There we go. Okay. So this is our grant submission. Um, one of the things, and Hema provided a wonderful link to um, the university-wide uh, funding opportunities, and it's one I actually haven't seen in a long time, so it's good to see that one, and we will add it to this list. But these are some funding opportunities and links that you might find helpful. Um, and as I especially like the first one. Berkeley has done this for years, and you know, if you're going to, we're going to give them the credit for it because it's wonderful, but it's specifically geared towards new and young faculty. So there's a lot of great ideas about grants there for new people. Um, the grant, grants.gov that Hema had shown you, um, we have a link to how to get out there. NIH, if you want to go out there specifically to look at their grant um, uh, mechanisms and what might be coming up, you can go there. NSF, if you go to their funding site, you can put in some keywords and try and look. Um, Fed Connect is another where another place that you can find maybe Department of Energy, Department of Defense grants. There, that's another place to look. Um, Office of Naval Research. They seem to publish theirs in a separate place, so you might find some if your if your research would be appropriate there. You might look at that place. Um, if you're looking for maybe a um, someone a philanthropical organization to help you with a grant, um, maybe look. To them for funding. One of the places you can go to is this RFP bulletin from the Philanthropy News Digest. They have a lot of different things out there and you can run searches, you know, keywords like Hema had put in microbiology. You can put in keywords into the searches and you can get some great ideas. Um, MSU grant resources, besides the one that, that Hema provided that VPRI has now, which is wonderful, there's also a lovely one out that the MSU library keeps um, on, on grant resources. And then there are internal grant funding opportunities just to MSU, in, just internal to MSU that are funded through um, the Vice President for Research and Innovation. And we've given you a link to find those as well. So definition of new investigator, everybody's always asking this. So it kind of depends on, and, NSF and, the, and NIH are the two that probably use this designation the most. So NSF, it's if you've not been a PI or a co-PI on a federally awarded, uh, federally funded award, except if you have a, if it's a doctoral dissertation grant, if it's a fellowship or some kind of research planning grant. For NIH, they basically have two designations. There's an ESI, the early stage investigator, um, and the new investigator. So uh, early stage talks about uh, that uh, you've completed your terminal research degree within the past 10 years. And so those are prioritized. Um, new investigator is someone who's not previously received substantial independent funding from NIH. I don't believe that an R21 or an R03, if you're familiar with NIH, those smaller mechanisms count. They're usually looking at those larger grants. So you, you wouldn't necessarily lose that status. For NSF, we have to tell them if you're a beginning investigator, when we submit your proposal, when, when we submit your proposal, we have to mark a box that says that you're a new beginning investigator. For NIH, they're going to take that information based on your, it's called ERA Commons. That's like their, that's their, um, that's where they have, they, uh, we'll have your your grants end up out in ERA Commons. That's where you'll you'll do reports and do all those kinds of things for NIH. 
and NIH will look at the information in ERA Commons to make a decision that, that's affiliated with your profile to make the decision about early stage investigator and new investigator as well, because they'll be able to tell from your funding history. Um, so grant writing resources. So we so at the vice president's office, there is some grant editing of editing and consulting available. Um, and so they've worked with a lot of institutions. They know the, the best practices. Um, I don't know if both of these people are still there. We had Tom Holland, who specialized in NIH grants, and Sarah Steenrod, who specialized in NSF applications. Um, there is funding. Uh, this does cost money to have this done, and you would have to provide them with a copy of the proposal, a, a draft copy of your proposal, like at least six months ahead of time, or six, six weeks, I'm sorry, six weeks ahead of time. So just be aware, you have to have things done ahead of time, but uh, you can possibly use that. And I will tell you that it does, there is a cost to it, but the last few years they have been not charging people there's a, there's a piece that's covered by your department, um, and I think a piece covered by the college, but they've not been charging that in the last few years because of COVID and everything going on. They, they, the, their, their note out on their website still states that at the current time, they're still not charging, but they do change that. You know, they, they do have the, the ability to change that. If you want to use this grant editing service, make sure you're sending an email to Eric Hegg and to Helma Reguera, letting them know that you want to do so. There's probably some kind of a form you need to complete, and you just need to let them know so that they know if the charges come through. And, the, and you wanna, you'll probably also want to maybe let your department know. There might be a little piece they have to cover as well if they're charging out. I don't know when they're going to change the practice. They didn't really state anything on their website, they just sort of said until further notice. But it's a, um, we've had a lot of people who've really uh, learned a lot working with these people. Um, sponsor resources. Um, NIH has, they have a grant basics uh, site and a how to apply application guide. Now, I'll tell you the application guide will take you through uh, an application that's being done in a slightly different system than we use here at MSU. But the concepts are still all the same. It's just instead of doing it through assist or doing it through something called workspace, we'll be doing it through our internal system. But the end result will be the same. Um, NSF has their grant proposal guide. They update it annually. And I suggest if you're submitting to NSF that you find that guide and look through it because it'll help you a lot as you're trying to come up with your documents. USDA has general tips for grant success. It's still out there. Um, and then also, if you're, if you're applying to a USDA uh, proposal, to a, to a request there, there will be an application guide. And there's a, so there's, there can be multiple versions of that application guide. So there should be one when you're looking up, a, when you're looking up the solicitation. And it will show you a place to go that will, get, that will show you that guide and will give you step-by-step step instructions. My staff are also looking at these guides as we're working with you. So if you don't have time to read through the whole guide, but have a question about something, we can help you find the information. More than likely, we're going out to one of these places. NIH has the, what they call the, um, well, they have a guide too that, that explains all of their documents that they request that they're going to require from you as well. Uh, Department of Energy, they don't really have a lot of great resource. I mean, they so they tend to, in everything that they, when they publish a, a funding opportunity, they will give you all the instructions that, that you need right within that. So, um, but you can usually find information at this website. And then NASA uses Inspires, um, and that has a whole system that they use to submit and there's a guidebook for inspires and how to submit through inspires and then also with their uh with their solicitations and with the big if you do nasa you know what i'm talking about their big roses what they call roses uh solicitation which is hundreds and hundreds of pages talks about everything most everything they're going to fund every year 
And um, that will have very specific instructions as well that we need to follow for making sure the proposal is done right. So grant writing, it's a two-step process. So there's two pieces that are going on at the same time. So you've got your scientific piece that you're going to be working hard on, and, and, that's, and that's your discipline and your area of expertise. But there's a whole administrative piece that also has to happen, at, and, and they have to kind of happen together. We can't just do all of one and then do the other. And so we've had people say, well, I've written all my science, I'm done. Well, you're not because we haven't done any of the administrative piece yet, which is the budgeting and a whole bunch of other stuff and, and getting everything connected into the university system. Um, so in the I ran through this, so the sponsored programs administration, that's the people that we work with every day. Um, they are our BFFs and we, are, we have a very close relationship with them. They are the ones who can sign anything on behalf of Michigan State. We cannot, you cannot, Dr. Head cannot, Dr. Aguera cannot, our Dean, the Dean Duxbury cannot. <laughs> so these are the people, and there's other people also, but when it comes to research, these are the people that can sign on behalf of MSU. So we work with them very closely. So on the pre-award side, which is my office is a pre-award office, we have two teams there's and there's there's two teams in each in each group so we work with team two all the time so there's a proposal team those are the ones people that we work with the most and they are they're helping us get that proposal in compliance and out the door by the deadline and then once your grant is if you're if you receive a note when you when you receive a notice of funding um, then the awards group will come in and the, they will be the ones who will, who will start, who will uh, sign you, sign the documents and start heading towards getting that, getting you an account number so you can start spending on your grant. They'll go through all the terms and conditions and make sure that everything is, is good and there's nothing in there that MSU being a, a public institution that we can't, you know, there are certain terms that we can't accept. So they'll make sure that, that there's nothing in there that's, that causes problems. And then from there, they'll move it to the, then we move over to the post-award side, which is when your account gets set up and you're able to start spending. Then you have, um, it's the awards team. They're the ones who are gonna help you. Um, um, the, uh, they'll help you with your, like your progress reports and stuff that, that, anything that needs to maybe change at the time of award, they'll help you with some of that stuff. They'll help you do no cost extensions. If you need to request one, they'll handle those. The transaction group, they are looking at everything that gets charged to every grant at MSU to make sure that it meets all the criteria and that there's no issues. You might be at, you might have an award that says you can't charge uh, grad student tuition to your account at all. They're going to make sure that doesn't happen. They're the people who help make sure that doesn't happen. There's a reporting group and they're gonna run all those yearly reports or however uh, often the reporting has to be done. They're gonna be helping with that and making sure that the financial reporting is all done and up to date. And then there's the cash management group and they're the ones who are basically pulling down funds from the award and making sure there's, you know, there, that, there's, that everything's moving uh, smoothly on that part. So that as you're spending on your grant, they're making sure that that there's money in your account to make that happen. So that's that's central administration. They are all under the vice president for research and, and innovation as well. Um, so they have a deadline. So we work with the Office of Sponsored Programs. They are the pre-award arm. That's those are the ones we work with. They have a 1063 policy deadline. So for them, for a proposal to be considered on time, which means you get top priority in their queue, you have to notify OSP 10 business days. So don't forget about weekends, don't forget about holidays, 10 business days before a sponsored deadline. We need to be notifying them of the intent to submit a proposal. Six business days before the sponsored deadline, we need to make sure that that budget and justification have been finalized and it has been sent to OSP for their review and approval. And then three business days before the sponsor deadline, the proposal needs to be completely finished and submitted to OSP by five o'clock. So with that deadline in, in mind, so, and what I remind you is that if you provide us documents at 4.30 on the day it's supposed to be at OSP by five o'clock, 
there's no way we're going to get them uploaded in time because probably not only are we uploading yours, but we've got, you know, five, six, seven, ten other proposals we might have to be dealing with that day. We have a perfect storm coming up in our office in a couple of weeks where we literally have about 30 proposals due in, in about in, in the span of one week. So we're we're working on that, making plans for that. But we've asked some people to get some documents to us ahead of time to help us meet this deadline. Not their science, but the the things that, you know, like their bio sketches and some of the other stuff. So just a reminder that, you know, it's great to have the documents to us, but you also, you need to give us time to get them uploaded for you too. And, and review them and make sure that they're correct. Because every sponsor has different rules and that is, we keep up on those and what every sponsor requires. So, so then there's also an internal deadline policy for us. So OSP says you have to have everything done to be on time. And then at that point it becomes late and then they will not, they will work on the on time for things first and then they will go to the, and work on late items. If you, if you, um, they will not absolutely guarantee the proposal will be submitted, but so far, knock on wood, we have not had an experience where a late proposal has not been submitted, but it causes a lot of anxiety. So then we have an internal deadline policy. So, so your documents are due to, your whole proposal really is due to OSP three business days before the deadline. But then the next morning, if then we're saying that absolutely what we refer to lovingly as our drop dead deadline. <laughs> and if you, you must have all the documents to us by 8 a.m. the next morning, you have to have everything to us. And that includes if you've got sub awards, you got to make sure they've got all their documents to us too. And we'll help work with those sub award institutions, but we need everything. I mean, everything so that we can get it done, get the get the proposal routing, get everything handled. So we're, we say that if you've got to have it to us by 8 a.m. that morning, that is our absolute, you know, that side deadline. If you don't make that deadline, um, we, you'll hear from us. And th there's a good chance you may not be able to submit your proposal at all. Um, we will require you so depending on the reason, so sometimes sometimes there might be, you know, if you've got a document where just you were working on it, you almost had it done and something fell apart, you just need a couple more hours. We will, I'll usually go ahead and grant you that so I, that I'm not bothering Dr. Hegg with those little things. But for the most part, we're going to make you reach out to Dr. Hegg. We will stop working on your proposal until you get permission from Dr. Hegg to move forward. So you're going to have to go to him and while he's wonderful and understanding about things, he's not going to let you abuse that privilege either. So, you know, things happen, stuff happens, you get sick, something, I mean, you know, a child gets sick, something happens. It, it, it just does. So we do have, you know, so you, there may be a point where you might have to reach out to Dr. Head, but we're at that point, if you, we will, you'll hear from myself or if I'm not in, doc, you'll hear from Danya. That just basically says you have to reach out and ask permission from Dr. Hag, and and we will stop working on your proposal till we hear from him that it's okay to move forward. Again, um, the other thing you need to be aware of is we need at least at at the absolute minimum five business days of a proposal notification of a proposal, or we just can't assist you. And I can't tell you how many times people unfortunately have. Well, I wrote all the science. Now let's go and it's due the next day. It's, it's, it's frustrating for me because I feel bad for them because they didn't give us enough notice and we, we can't drop everything else to then jump in and do something like that at the last minute, unfortunately. So if, if you come in with something and you haven't given us five business days notice, we're, you're probably just going to hear back that, sorry, we can't help. Now there are also... Um, Occasionally, we might be able to accommodate something if it's uh, like if a, if all of a sudden you get notified by a sub award or another institution that they want to have you on a sub award and and you know but you only have a few days to get it ready. I can never guarantee that that can happen. We'll look at our workload. If you came in today and asked for that, I'd have to say no. 
because we're too busy with this huge deadlines coming up. But at another time, if we're not quite as busy, it's possible we could do it, but there's no guarantees. So just give us as much notification as you can. Um, and then again, we need time to upload your documents, give you a proposal to review, so you wanna plan ahead. Um, the other thing I want to just before I go forward, I just want to say, so if something happens and you're looking at not even being able to submit until the day it's due for whatever reason, you will have to reach out to Dr. Hegg and ask for permission for that. Permission is not granted. He, we strongly, there are reasons, you know, illness, um, you know, family illness, uh, maybe something drastic happened to a computer and you lost your proposal, you know, part, you know, your most recent work. There are things that can happen that will make you have to be last minute. Um, I worked with a faculty member once where literally his brother died right in front of him, young man sitting in the room with him. And he called me to say, I think I need an extension. Hey, we, we're gonna grant that. We're gonna, we're gonna work with you. We, we wanna help you succeed. But if it's just that you, just haven't been contacting us and notifying us. And all of a sudden you decide you need, you know, up until the deadline, you there's a good chance you're not gonna get that approved, but Dr. Head will be the one to make that determination. So we will refer you to him and we will ask you for that. He will, if you, if you reach out ahead of time, he will always say, try to make all the deadlines and then we'll talk about it later. So just know that he's, he understands how busy my office is and um, and he and I do talk every time. That, and if I'm not in, he's talking with Danya too to make sure that that we're on the same page with some of these last minute things. So bearing all that in mind, this is a suggested timeline: ten to twelve weeks before the deadline, you should start planning. You know, you know, you you, you probably some of you may know right now that you're planning to submit a proposal in six months. Um, based on, you know, you might have already been starting to think about that, but start planning, contact my office. Um, let your, you might want to let your department administrator know you're submitting, depending on what department you're in, they might want to know. We will let them know too. Um, if you have a mentor in your department, let them know too that you're planning to submit because you might, you're probably going to want to, you're probably going to want them to review your proposal and offer you suggestions. So give them a heads up that you're going to be doing that. Um, you want to start looking for potential issues, um, you know, that could be coming up. We'll talk about a few of those in a minute. Six to 10 weeks before, make sure you're contacting your colleagues. You're, draft, you're starting to draft various parts of your proposal. You're starting to collect all those required documents and the information. And you want to make sure you're addressing any potential issues there might be. About four to six weeks, if you're, you might be looking for people to review your science. You want them to look over your proposal. You're going to start wanting to seek that input from them. Um, and four to six weeks before your deadline, if you know, you, hopefully you're far enough along in your research that you can start working with us on putting together that budget and justification, which my office will help you with. Two to four weeks before your deadline, you want to get final, you want to finalize and assemble. We're going to route that internal proposal development document that has to be done here at MSU. Um, and then a week before the deadline, if it's, um, we want, it, it'd be great if a week before you had the proposal pretty much done um, and we could get things, you know, moving. Now this is, you know, in, in the best possible world, but those deadlines are not, um, they're not unreasonable. And you will be surprised. We have had more people have problems. I can't get my references formatting correctly. And it takes them all night one night just to do one document like that. Things will always take longer than you expect. It's Murphy's Law of Research. And it's, it's also Murphy's Law of Research Administration. <laughs> so just expect that everything's going to take you maybe a little bit longer than you really are going to expect and plan for that. And if you haven't done ahead of time, have a party. <laughs> it's great. It's done. <laughs> We, we do what we call our proposal submission happy dance. So, so contacting us for, for assistance. There's a, there's a new proposal request form. Um, and then there's also additional resources that you can find on this PI page. And we'll give you a grant submission deadline. And I wanna just show you that page quickly. So let me just come out here and I'm on the wrong one. 
So this, there we go. So this is, we, and we provided the link to this. So this is, uh, a, and also on our NatSci page, you can also request, um, and it's, it's hiding behind this thing and I can't get this thing to move. There it goes. Also here it says proposal request form and it will also take you to that principal investigators page that we've given you here. Um, Dania Diaz has put together this wonderful system to help us uh, keep track of things and hopefully make your lives easier. But do you need help with a new proposal? You just hit that request form and it'll start asking you some information and information about your proposal things that we need to know so that we can help you get through this system. It'll ask, you know, who else is going to be on your proposal? Are you going to have any subawards to other institutions? Maybe you're doing an NSF grant and there's other collaborators from other universities um, that we need to be aware of. So it'll give us a lot of that information that will let us help you through that process. So we'll put, so we'll have you go there, go back out here. We will, now, now I'm going to get that back up there. There we go. Um, we will give you a grant submission timeline that will give you the, when your budget is due, when, when your proposal is due by 5 p.m. to OSP, you know, for the end of the day. And also, we'll also give you one that says, okay, here's that, you know, NatSci hard deadline, eight o'clock that morning, we have to have everything. Don't think of your deadline anymore as like, as, October 5th, for example, we have a huge deadline coming up October 5th. Your deadline for October 5th, 5th should, the only thing you should be thinking of is 8 a.m. on October 3rd. <laughs> that should be the deadline that you're thinking about. Okay, and this is just, and I didn't realize I've done this. So I gave you just a picture of our, our PI page and we've given you kind of a, a link. So the potential issues you could have, um, there could be issues with financial conflict of interest disclosure. And this is over and above just trying to actually do it in a, in a proposal. You may, you may be working with an organization that you have some kind of conflict with that the has to be disclosed. So if that's the case, you're gonna make, wanna make sure you're talking to your chairperson so that, cause you can have a conflict. It's not a, a bad thing to have a conflict. It just has to be managed. It has to be brought, it has to be very transparent and it has to be managed. So you're gonna to wanna to walk, talk to your chair so that th you can start talking about the management of that conflict. There could be patent, copyright, IP, publication restrictions. There could be a lot of those kinds of restrictions that come up. So when we assign, when a proposal is assigned, not only is are you reading that solicitation or that request for proposals, my office, my staff are reading it, and we're sending it over to OSP and they're going through it with a fine tooth comb to, to look at those things, to see if perhaps they're, you know, to look at that from their language, to see if there's anything in there that they're concerned about. So, and then they'll let us know if there's anything they're concerned about. Um, there could be export, export control certifications that need to be done at some point. Regulatory affairs, if you're working with human subjects or vertebrate animals or human blood materials, radioisotopes, recombinant DNA, pathogens or biohazards or hazardous regulated chemicals. If you are, you just need to let people know so that if you, um, say when you're funded, <clears throat> then they know that they're that those are part of the proposal and they know that as they're getting things set up for your funding, that they're notifying the correct people and that, that they're aware and the right regulatory people are involved and are going to make sure that they keep an eye on what's on that particular you know, uh, regulatory issue that there is. Um, there may be required cost share or a required match of some kind or other required MSU commitments. And if that's the case, if you do have cost share, then you're gonna, you're gonna be wanting to, to make sure if you're aware of it already, let us know but you're gonna to wanna to talk to your chair and it's ultimately gonna to go to Dr. Hegg. And he needs to know as quickly as possible about these, about requirements for cost share. And so my office, I will let him know if we're working on a proposal that involves cost share as well, because he's gonna, he may have to reach out to other colleges to get them, you know, depending on where the appointments are, he's gonna to have to reach out to other colleges to get them to contribute to the cost share as well. 
So it's one of those things we have to be working on quickly because that takes time to put together. And we may need a, we're gonna need a draft of an abstract from you so that we can send that as well when Dr. Hegg is you know, reaching out to everyone else for required cost share. Um, there might be additional space requirements or renovations or alterations. If you have some of those requirements, we can't, that, that's gonna require the Office of Planning and Budgets to be involved. And we're gonna have to have documentation from them before you can move forward. So if you have space requirements, renovations or alterations, you've got to be talking with your chair and with Dr. Hegg so that they can help you because they need to know what needs to happen so that they can help make it happen from the college's level. Um, there may be indirect cost limitations there. And that's there's restrictions sometimes in some of the solicitations or RFPs we get. We're looking for those as well but sometimes it's gonna require us to request a, a waiver. Um, not all the time, but once in a great while it will. Um, we, if you're dealing with international, if, you, if you're doing international research, we may need to contact the Office of International Programs to make sure we're budgeting everything for that foreign component that we need to, because different countries have different rules, if, especially if you're hiring someone who's actually gonna be working in that other country, they may have different labor law, well, they will have different labor laws and everything else. So Office of International Programs can, can help us work through those. It may be a limited submission, which means only one or two proposals can come out of MSU. If that's the case, then there's a whole pre-proposal process that has to be done to the vice president's office, usually eight weeks before a deadline that you need to do. And if that's the case, we will help you, you know, we can help guide you in that, but look to see if there's, if there, if it says anything about the number of proposals from MSU being limited, because you will not, if you have not gotten permission from the vice president's office, you will not be allowed to submit that proposal. And there may be specific data requirements too. If you happen to be working on a training grant, there are a boatload of tables of data that have to be done for those. And um, Adele's working on one right now for the Department of Microbiology. And it's, it's a lot of work to, to get those together. So you just need to be aware of some of these potential issues and start addressing them as soon as possible. If you wait, you could, you could catch something that can't get fixed before submission and, and, that we, and then we can't submit, unfortunately, if we haven't dealt with them. Most of the time we're able to submit anyway and still work on them, but we just need, need to make sure that everybody's aware. Registrations, um, MSU's already set up with everything that you need. Sorry, I'm getting weird things in here. Registration, we, MSU is, is registered in everything. So you don't have to worry about that at all. MSU is there, we are registered in absolutely everything. So you don't have to worry about if you're gonna apply, do we have a SAM registration? Do we have a registration in grants.gov? Don't worry about that. So um, if you already have an ID through um, for NSF or um, with NIH, you don't have to get a new one. You just have to have that affiliated with MSU. And if you send us um, your ID, we can help make that happen for you. Um, we are already registered in all sites. ERA Commons, if you need to get an ERA Commons, go ahead and, and send a message to our office and we will send you a list of the, of the information we need to get from you. And then we'll work with, OSB, um, with uh, OSP and they will actually, they're the ones who have permission to actually create those IDs. So they'll get that done for you. Um, for if you, so for research.gov, PAMS and Inspires, if you are not already a user in those, you can go ahead and create a user account, but make sure you're letting us know about it because you're gonna to need to affiliate yourself with MSU and then MSU will complete that affiliation request so that then you know, you've got your ID and you are automatically affiliated with MSU. So just make sure if you're, if you're doing something like that, let us know and we'll help you through that process. Those are quick things and OSP and my office do them all the time. Um, Conflict of interest. <laughs> um, so you're you're at MSU. You're going to be re required to submit 
both an annual conflict of interest disclosure and then also a project specific conflict of interest disclosure. So just be aware that that's going to happen. Um, there's also, if you're, if you're doing NIH proposals, anything that's through PHS, um, which is mostly NIH, there's conflict of interest training that you will have to do as well. So if you're planning on doing a grant to NIH, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that, you know, let me know and we can get you set up for doing your, I can give you the link to the COI office and the training, it's right here, the link is right there, but you can go out there and you can get the training done and have that done. And I think it has to be redone every three years. Every, I think it's, I think it's on a three-year cycle, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I will warn you that currently we're having a few issues in our KR system with conflict of interest. So don't panic if you get out there to approve something and then you can't do your conflict of interest. We've got people who will help you make sure that it gets done. So don't panic. Um, institutionally limited. They can be limited to one per institution, one per college within the university. So you have to read carefully. We're reading that as well. OSP is reading it. We talked about the pre-proposals that need to be done. And there's in, we've given you the link to the institutionally limited site. They have a list of the things they're aware of that require, you know, that require that are institutionally limited. But we have found that there's often new solicitations and RFPs that come out that do not, that they're unaware of. And so we, so just because it's not on that list doesn't mean it's that you don't have to do the pre-proposal ahead of time. So if, if you don't see it on the list, contact us, we'll help you work with them to make sure that you get done what you need to get done. Communication, Eric said it, and I think Emma said it too. It's so important. So you want to make sure you're, you're con make sure you confirm con participation of all your colleagues, collaborators, consultants, and subaward institutions. We've actually had grants blow up because people didn't know they were on the grant and then refused to sign off on things. So it, it's unfortunate. We never want to see that happen. So just make sure that everybody's, you've got their commitments. Um, develop an outline for your proposal and assign sections and deadlines to people within your group. Um, and make sure that you're setting reasonable deadlines, but also make sure you know, you're not setting one deadline right before the real deadline, because many people don't quite get it to you on time. So make sure you're giving yourself a little time to, to be able to bug them to get what you need. Start collecting all your information as quickly as you can um, and communicate and work early with everyone. Don't, I would just, I can't stress enough, don't wait to contact them. Um, and the other thing, just before, Donnie's gonna get started here in just a moment, I'm just gonna talk to you about budgets. But, and so I'm gonna unshare, and while I'm unsharing and we're getting ready to go to the next part, I'll just do that so she can get, start to get set up. The one thing I do want to say to you is if you have subaward institutions on your budget, like you're, when a subaward means that you're not, so MSU is doing it, but we want um, University of Michigan to do a piece of it, piece of your proposal. More than likely, we're going to have to enter into a special relationship with them, and we're going to have to have special documents from them and put them into our budget as a subaward or a subcontract. And we're, when that happens, we have to give them time because we need time to do our proposals. They need time to do their piece of it and then get it to us. And we need their stuff before we can get our budget approved. So it's really important that if you're working with other institutions that we're reaching out to them as quickly as we can and giving them as much time as we can to get their pieces to us. Okay, and I'll let Danya go on and uh, move forward from here. Thanks, Judy. So in the next few slides, I'm going to be talking about the proposal budget. That is one of the main um, ways that our office assists you is to create a proposal budget that meets both the MSU requirements and the sponsors requirements. And we're going to go over the elements of direct costs, direct costs being charges that are made directly to your funding as opposed to indirect costs, which we will discuss later. So the first cost category are salaries and wages. 
Uh, one thing we want you to be aware of is that you may tell us to budget a certain percentage of time and we will use a percentage in our calculations. But when it comes to creating the final version of the budget, effort will be presented in terms of person months because that's what the federal sponsors want to see. Um, under salaries and wages, we have faculty, postdoctoral research associates, graduate students, undergrads in hourly labor, and technical and clerical support. For faculty, we have annual faculty who are paid on a 12-month basis and academic faculty who are paid on a nine-month basis. Be aware that only academic faculty can request summer salary. Um, postdoctoral research associates, there is a minimum salary at MSU that we need to uh, budget, which is $50,637. However, you can request that we budget for more. So if you want to pay the postdoc $60,000, that is certainly doable. Um, graduate students, a standard full-time graduate student is working 20 hours per week. So be aware that a full-time or 100% grad is actually a 50% FTE. That's just something to be aware of. So if we're talking in terms of a 50% um, grad, we're actually talking 10 hours a week or quarter time. Just something to, to know. Um, for technical and clerical support, I wanted to mention Technical, yes, technical staff are allowed for sure. However, clerical staff must be approved by the sponsor. It's usually required that they spend 100% of their effort on the project. And it's very rare to see clerical staff on anything but a large grant, such as a center grant or an education grant. The next cost category are French benefits. And MSU utilizes what they call specific identification fringe rate. That means that each individual has an individual fringe rate. This is because the rate is a calculation between their salary and the fringe benefit package, which consists of both percentage-based benefits and lump sum benefits. When you put that all together, each individual person ends up having a different rate. So you will see that each person has a different rate. And also the rate varies from year to year because as the fringe benefit package changes and the salary changes, the rate will also change. For postdocs, they have special rates. Uh, for years one through three, they have a reduced rate for years four and five of service. They have an additional um, benefit of uh, retirement. So their rate goes up somewhat. And then any postdoc that has been working at MSU more than five years will just have the standard SI rate. So basically the same as any other full-time staff. So now that I say that, I wanna add, when you name, if you're requiring a postdoc in your budget and you have a specific person in mind, let us know because we need to see what year they're in at MSU to know what fringe benefit we need to apply to them. Otherwise, we assume that it's a new hire and we will apply the lowest fringe rate. For graduate students, their fringe consists of the cost of health insurance. And um, that is a rate that is established every year and we know what it is, so we will apply it. Hourly workers, and that includes students who are working hourly during the summer, the standard fringe is FICA, Social Security and Medicare, which is 7.65%. However, if they are working 30 hours or more for 90 days or more, then they become eligible for health insurance. And if we're budgeting, say, a full-time hourly worker all summer long, we will have to add $464.49 per month to the cost of that line item to cover the health insurance that is mandated. 
And I apologize, I never switched the screen. That's the fringe rate screen. So the next, um, the next category is equipment. And equipment is defined as the cost of a standalone item that is that costs more than $5,000 and has a useful life more than one year. Equipment can be fabricated. So if you are buying the parts to create the standalone equipment that then meets the criteria, those parts, even if they cost less than 5,000 each, will be budgeted in the equipment category. As an aside, things like computers are generally not equipment. They are listed under supplies. The next category is travel in which you would budget for domestic or international travel. Here, the important distinction is that if you are planning international travel, you do need to let us know so that we can include that category in your budget because some sponsors, NSF in particular, if you don't have international travel already approved on your award, they will not allow you to use your money to pay for international travel. So if you anticipate doing international travel, let us know so it is part of your proposal budget. And also at that point, we will need to know what your intended or anticipated destinations are going to be. Next is participant support costs. These are defined and the definition I know can be confusing. Items such as stipends or subsistence allowances, travel allowances and registration fees paid to or on behalf of participants or trainees, but not employees in connection with conferences or training projects. So basically you're paying people a stipend or you're helping cover their travel, their meals, their lodging, or any other related costs with a training project or a conference. It's important to note that MSU employees cannot be considered participants. Um, collaborators, their costs, their travel costs, their lodging costs, et cetera, cannot be included in participant support costs. And also incentives to study uh, subjects, such as $20 for taking a survey, is also not part of participant support costs. And very important to know that participant support costs are restricted and once they are approved by the sponsor, you are not allowed to rebudget out of this category. So the other direct cost categories may include supplies and materials. Of course, they have to be project related. Publications, consultant services, computer services, subawards, tuition, service fees, or research incentives. Uh, for consultant services, please be aware that we need to budget a rate, either per day or per hour. Uh, we are not allowed to budget a lump sum payable to an individual. And finally, we have facilities and administration costs. These are indirect costs. This is negotiated, this is based on an agreement that's negotiated with the federal government, specifically the Department of Health and Human Services. They are, these costs are meant to support the university infrastructure. So they pay for the administration, the building, the maintenance, heat, electricity, et cetera. And the current MSU rate is 56.5% of modified total direct costs or 26% of the project is off campus. There are other rates that can be applied depending on the type of proposal. So these are not the only two negotiated rates. We won't go into them right now. But for example, if it's um, educational, it's 8%. But for the most part, the rate that we will um, utilize is the 56.5%. Modified total direct costs means that you've deducted participants, um, you take the total direct cost and you deduct participant support, tuition and fees, and any amount in subawards over 25,000 for each subaward, as well as equipment. 
So once you deduct, deduct these four items, you have the base upon which we calculate the f &A. Sponsors may have different rates, but it has to be documented. So this rate is negotiated with the federal government. For the most part, every federal sponsor will honor it. However, sometimes people do proposals to foundations or to other sponsors. They may have their own rates, but those rates have to be documented. For example, they have to be listed in the solicitation. So if this sponsor only pays 20% and it is written down in the solicitation, we have no problem with that. However, if you're doing a proposal to a federal agency, you cannot reduce the rate. If you want to reduce the rate, you have to get permission for that from MSU, and that is very rarely granted. All right, so the next item would be the budget justification. And this is where you describe and you justify every item that is in your budget. Please do not include anything that is not in the budget because this can be interpreted as cost share. And some sponsors, specifically NSF, do not want you to discuss cost share in the budget justification. So only stick to the stuff that is included in the budget. Also, we recommend that you do not include numbers in your justification. It may be that the sponsor that you're applying to, Department of Defense comes to mind, may require that you itemize everything in your justification. So then you do need to include the numbers. But if that is not part of the requirements, we suggest that you leave them out because at some point you may need to revise the budget. And if you revise the budget and you've included all of these numbers in your justification, then we have to go back and make sure that the justification still matches the budget. So just to save a little bit of extra trouble, if it's not required, leave them out. Another thing, another suggestion that we have is not to mention course buyout or honorarium in your justification. Um, the federal sponsors want to pay for your time. They don't want to pay special payments and this is kind of a, you know, something that they don't look well upon. So next, I want to talk about the differences between a subaward, a consultant, and a contractor. A subaward performs programmatic portion of project activities, must follow all applicable guidelines and compliance requirements, and is jointly responsible for project design, conduct, or reporting with MSU. So in other words, a subaward is a partner in the project. They are equally responsible for all compliance and they are integral to the project. Meanwhile, a consultant provides services, is not responsible for project design, conduct, or reporting, and MSU owns all resulting intellectual property. So a consultant is an expert for hire. And it should be that we can replace one expert with another, so they are not essential to the project. The same is for a contractor. A contractor acts as a dealer, distributor, merchant, or other seller, usually has published rates, and operates in a competitive environment, is not responsible for project design, conduct, or reporting. So a contractor you can think of as a vendor. Again, something they provide a, probably an item, maybe a service that's not expertise because the expertise comes with the consultant and you can easily replace them with another vendor without affecting your project. So that's a way to tell the difference between, you know, with regards to what role a collaborator or a service provider uh, should assume in your project. Next, if you do plan on having a subaward in your proposal, you need to let us know as soon as possible. Our new intake form asks you about that, so I would take advantage and give us as much information as possible when you're uh, completing the proposal assistance form. We need to know who the institution is, the PI, hopefully a research administrator name, and their contact information. 
then we will reach out to them as early as possible in the process and request documents. Some of these documents are the final detailed budget. The budget needs, in order for us to use it, the budget needs to be final and approved by the institution. So aside from the budget, we need the justification, a statement of work, and a signed subrecipient commitment form. This is a commitment form signed by their Office of Sponsored Programs. So we will email them, request this information, and we will ask them to provide these documents to us several weeks before um, the actual proposal deadline because, for example, the budget that they provide is part of your proposal budget. And we can't finalize our budget internally unless we have their final numbers. So that's why we need everything early. Likewise, if MSU and you are going to be a subawardee to someone else's proposal, the process is the same. They will, I mean, please let us know who to expect a communication from, or maybe even we reach out to them, but we need to know the institution, the PI, the research administrator and their contact information. Um, MSU will provide to them the same items, a final budget, a budget justification, statement of work, and a signed subrecipient commitment form. And we will expect them to want these items several weeks before the actual deadline. And that is the end of my segment, so back to Judy. <laughs> Judy, you're muted. You're still muted. Now I'm unmuted, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm talking, you can't hear me. What else is new? All right, so the Kuali Research Administration System. This is our system here at MSU that we use. It handles everything from proposal submission through the life of an award. So they're either done what they call a system to system submission, which is basically like our computer is going to talk with grants and the systems just, eh, my mouth won't work. System to system submissions are when we're, when we're having to submit through grants.gov. So that's NIH and DOE and the depart, most of the departments of defense, almost all of them. Um, and uh, let's see, USDA. So there are a whole bunch of sponsors where the submissions are done through grants.gov. So we're actually going to use KR, the KR system to do that. So the other thing that we call them, so like if you're submitting to NSF or to NASA, and we're going to do a proposal out in their system, um, rather than doing it right through the KR system, then those are, we refer to those as summary proposals. So if you ever hear someone say summary pr proposal, that just is what it means. So it really doesn't impact what you do. You're still going to have to do a bunch of steps with the system. So it must be completed and fully approved up to OSP's level prior to the grant submission. So this is something that we're going to fill out information on. The budget is going to go in there. We're going to, if, if it's a system to system submission, wow, I can't say that today. If it's S to S, it's shorter. Uh, we will we'll get all the documents out there into the system. We'll let you know make a copy of it that you can review and all this stuff. And then we'll put things into route. <clears throat> we can swap out documents if we need to. But but we have to have when we put it into route, everybody who is uh, um, who's getting any kind of overhead credit split on it, um, like the PI, the co-investigators, key personnel at MSU, they will all need to approve. Then all of their departments have to approve then all of their colleges have to approve. And sometimes if you have international activities, we have other people who might have to go in and approve as well. So it takes some time to make that happen. And every all the approvals must be in place before the proposal can be submitted to the final uh, institution. So we gave you a link to access the KR system. Um, and so within the electronic business system, the EBS system that we have here at MSU, one of the tiles that comes up when you log in there is a research administration tile. So you can click there. Me, because I'm in it every day, all day, I tend to go straight to the system 
So we've given you a link to get right in. Um, your project specific and your annual conflict of interest disclosures will be done through this system as well. So um, multi-factor authentication will be required for this. I'm just kind of giving you a little screenshot. It's required for access to many systems at MSU. Um, giving you a link to it. If you don't have multi-factor authentication set up yet, please get it set up right away. Register your credentials. Um, if you don't use the app, the, the Okta Verify app, which I've kind of given you a screenshot of what it looks like on my phone. If you're using, if you're having it text you or, or having it give you your codes by, by phone or by text, please make sure you set up a credential so that that can be done internationally because um, we've had more than one situation where faculty have been in China or Africa somewhere and did not have it up, have their credentials set up to be able to receive them in a foreign country. And it created a lot of problems and a lot of last minute running around trying to get things done. So be aware of that. We also re re recommend that you register more than one credential so you have a backup because, you know, with my luck, my phone system is going to go down by, you know, my, my internet pro provider, something's going to happen. I'm going to need a backup just in case, or I'm going to leave my phone at home when I come out to MSU. And so I want to have, make sure that my phone here at MSU can also, you know, if I ha had to, I could, I could uh, have that as a credential as well. Um, overhead credit distribution. So this is, gets confusing. So basically there's all, let's say you're on the grant and you have two co-investigators on your grant. And they're both from different units in MSU and you're working on a grant together. There's a distribution that we have to figure out that has to do with how, has to do with their everybody's intellectual contribution to your grant. So we want to determine out of a pie, you know, of 100%, how much of that should go to each individual person. And relative intellectual contribution is what we usually refer to. So we want to make sure that everybody gets an appropriate amount of that overhead credit because when your grant is funded and that indirect and those indirect costs come in that that we put into your project some of that's going to come back to your department and back and potentially you know kind of it's going to come to your department and perhaps back to you depending on how your department has it set up so we want to make sure that that you're getting the credit that's due you so um, if you if you are on another person's project and that and another unit is routing it, you want to just kind of check and make sure you're getting some kind of credit in the in that system. You know that when you're going into approve, make sure you're getting some of that credit. We try and keep an eye on that too because we have to. My office approves on behalf of NatSci for all the proposals that come in, and one of the things I do look at is that I look to see if our faculty are getting credit, and I can't tell you how many times we've had things routed where they have our faculty there and they want them to approve and then they give them no credit. And it, it's like, no, that's that's just not right. So we do look. So you want to make sure you're, you're keeping an eye on that. <clears throat> so just so you're aware, and I can explain this more if you ever need to know more about it, but your overhead allocation, it's split between the college and then departments based on your base appointment. And then if you if you have like a space, if you have a lab space, then your lab's going to get some of that, your, wherever your lab space is, and whoever's doing the post award, that department. So if you're split between two departments, say biochem and Kellogg Biological, but your but your main appointment is that your if your lab's at Kellogg Biological, then they're going to get space credit but maybe your grant's actually gonna get administered through Biochem. So then Biochem is gonna get that post-award grant administration piece. And the KR system will automatically calculate that allocation according to your base appointment. So this is just an example of what it looks like in places. So I put myself and Hema in, gave us each 50%, just has to equal 100. So it'll, you know, Hema's in more than one unit than I, she, she's in two different units. And she has, well, she doesn't, her, because both of her, she's in both NatSci and in um, Ag Bio Research. So she split 50-50 between those two. Her lab is all in, in, in microbiology. And so 
we don't have an, a special space credit set up for her. And me, I don't have a lab. I just <laughs> I have a com have computer will travel. So you know that's all I need. <laughs> so that's just an example. So we will be asking you on this if there's more than one person on your grant. Um, and just there's a few more final slides, but this really is just about the last one. Just remember to plan ahead and work with us. Review your solicitation. Hema said it best. She knows people who haven't read their solicitation. We know them too. And read it because it gives you some very valuable information. And we'll be reading it as well. Follow the formatting guidelines for the grants for the uh, for the sponsor. Everybody has different formatting requirements. Most of the time it's one inch margins and they want to see a font at least 12, 11 point, if not 12 point. So, but keep an eye on that. If you have a question on that, ask us. Um, we're going to be looking at those things. That's part of our job is to be the font police. We are not spell checkers. We don't have time for that, but we do check formatting. Um, make sure you're contacting internal reviewers, your people, you know, that you want to review your grant, your mentor in your department, whoever it might be. Get those people lined up and ask for help. Ask, you know, if you're not sure, ask for help. You know, if we don't know the answer, we can help guide you. Um, this is just some general information about our office. Um, the, the email at the top, the natsi.ors, please, 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 all research related. If you have a personal thing you need to talk to me about, feel free to use my personal email address. But otherwise, I live and die out of that email. And I had an email that sat in my box now for three days this week that I did not have a chance to see because I was so busy working out of NatSci ORS. I never got to my personal email and then it, it got buried really low and then I found it today. And unfortunately, you know, I was very late getting back with the person. So please use that. So the list of my staff in the office right now, then, and they are phenomenal people and they, they work hard and they're, they're, they're great to work with. And then the other thing I just have provided, just let you know what our main areas of responsibilities are, what we'll do, you know, we're, We'll basically try and help you as much as you can through this process and you know knowing that the first few times doing it at msu you're going to need a little more help until you kind of get it under your belt we know that that's all great um we've given you some msu research resources as well just in, um because we're going to send you these so just all a whole bunch and one of the things that's on here acronyms that are commonly used at msu if you're like me you walk into a place when I came to research administration, when I previously had worked in the College of Osteopathic Medicine in student-related stuff and then budget stuff, and then I came over here and there were all these acronyms that I that just blew my mind and I had no idea what they meant. So it took me a long time. So there's a list of acronyms that you might find helpful. And that's pretty much it. I know it was a huge data dump for all of you. <laughs> Um, and, and when you work with my, you know, let my staff know, and then we'll work with you individually so we can answer questions and everything at that time and, and let you know anything that you might need to know. And, you know, at that point and, and help you through everything. I mean, we, you know, we're here, we're here to see you succeed and to see you, you know, grow your research, you know, your, your, uh, grow your research here at MSU. And we're, we're a service organization. We're only as good as that last proposal that we submitted. And we all know that. And so we are, we are invested in each of you. And this is our discipline. Like you all have your own disciplines. Research administration is our discipline. We study hard on this. We, we keep up to date on all the latest rules and they change constantly. And that's what we do. And so we are here to help you and to help you succeed. And we will do it in any way we possibly can. And as Eric said, we just ask that you guys then in turn help us help you. So by, you know, keeping up with what we're, what, you know, what we need and, and you know, and yeah, times you won't be able to get us something right away. But just when you, we, we've had a lot of faculty who come in, they ask for help, and then we don't hear from them forever. And that gets nerve wracking for us because we're worried that something's gone wrong. So you know, we will send you little reminders if that does happen and, and say, are you still planning to submit and try to keep things moving along? And we will try and help keep you on schedule to get submitted on time. 
Does anybody have any questions? Oh, did anyone have any questions? Yeah, sorry. Can I just add something before the question? Oh, that sure. it just it just dawned on me. It's a little bit unrelated, but uh, thinking from the promotion and tenure process, um, remember to keep a record of all the grants, the budget, the the, the uh, when you were submitted, etc., because you're going to have to use that information for your form D. And, and I, I hate to be Debbie Downer, but most likely you'll have to apply for many grants, um, you know, to get some funded. And I'm constantly submitting grants. I have a very thick skin. So be ready, learn, enjoy the process of really wishing what you want to do. And that's really the best advice I can give you. And don't give up and uh, keep a record. They are not failed attempts. It's part of the process of development. And uh, remember, there is a lot of luck associated with who reviews your grant, and that's not out of, you know, that's not in your control. But the effort of you submitting grants is valued. So make sure that that you include it and in, and in you start keeping that record. Just that, uh, Judy. Thank you. Uh, Judy, can I sure. uh, jump in real quick? So in terms of what Hema just said, um, we have a document library right now that we're working with where every PI that we work with has a folder and under that PI's folder or inside that PI's folder, we have all of their proposal submissions that they've worked on with us. And we are rolling out giving PIs access to their folders. So eventually, I mean, I you can reach out to me and I can um, give you access even if we don't get to you formally in the process. Uh, but basically, eventually, you'll have access to this and you'll be able to go in there and look at the final copies, the final documents for your submissions, mm -hmm. um, anything that you've worked at with us. So that's going to be helpful. And another thing that I wanted to mention is that sometimes people will work with another faculty member on a proposal and not be included in the FNA distribution on the internal proposal submission document. It's really important that your name is on there. Even if you're not a co-investigator, you're just key personnel, but it's very important that your name is on there because that means that your name will show up as having been involved with that project. Otherwise, there's no evidence in the university system. If you're, if you're working on something, make sure you're giving yourself credit for it. You're getting the credit you deserve for it. If you don't think you're getting the credit you're, you deserve, you can reach out to our office and we can help you with that if you want. Try to I can also be involved because there could be ethical implications. So the affairs part of my title is also to support you if Great. a conflict arises. So don't hesitate to contact me as well. Great. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions or anything, then we have recorded this. So we'll, um, it'll be, I have to get it to someone else first and then it will get Someday it'll we'll let y'all know when it gets out on the on the uh, our website, um, our ORS website, and we will also be sending you the slide deck, and and Hema will send me hers too, and we'll get the slides to you here uh, probably within the next week as well, so that you have all those all those links and information to help you out. And good luck here at MSU. We're very happy you're all here, and uh, we'll help you in any way we can. Yeah. Super. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs>